was involved with what we call the Illinois Shared Learning Environment. That um, is a project that involves 867 school districts in our state, 35 are participating in our project space. And what we're looking to be able to achieve with them is to be able to provide a web presence, a uh, web-based sign on, and um, uh, applications within that environment. And um, this slide <laughs> shows uh, many of the components and pieces that would be involved in the distribution of the uh, school districts that are participating in this environment. Um, yeah, you can definitely try. Let's uh, just to kind of work through this. The, um, uh, that's in the presentation. Yeah. Okay. As I said, we're actually working with school districts, but we also work with career workforce development. So we're actually entertaining an audience that is P20, anything from uh, preschool all the way up to career workforce development. So there's lots of uh, nuances in this environment in terms of what has to be supported um, for um, our user base. And um, what I wanted to be able to show you is a set of concepts that uh, relate to what's called a learning map, for instance, and that is a, a uh, visual representation of a regression of something happening. Did you get it started up? Cool. Uh, well, in any case, a learning map is a visual representation of a progression that shows both uh, learning objectives and then the means for actually making measures uh, of. Um, <laughs> okay, so now Let's double check the house. Okay, now this isn't my machine. I don't know what it is. It's just the old. So the Illinois Shared Learning Environment, it looks kind of whack on the screen, but um, it, it is effectively showing you what we have. You know, you can't see my own slides, but uh, in the state of Illinois there, you see all the blue dots, the blue dots are the school districts that we're working with. There are some golden dots and some red dots. The um, uh, golden dots are the partner sites or where three universities are actually collaborating, including the University of Illinois, Northern University, and Southern uh, Illinois. University as well. There are three data centers also involved. These data centers are actually owned by one of the partner sites, which is Illini Cloud. Illini Cloud 
is a consortium of school districts. So this is a collection of school districts who come together in order to share technology and resources um, to support one another. And um, um, this is another representation of the same slide. What we're attempting to do is there on the right side of the screen, uh, there's a concept of um, uh, being able to use um, uh, dynamic computing infrastructure, learning maps, uh, assessments, and uh, other applications that can be provided in this environment. So we're serving a really broad set of, um, of users and communities. Um, these would, uh, this drawing kind of represents some of the workspaces that are available for us. And as you can see, we've got little people all the way to big people that we're actually serving with our environment. Okay, you portal again is a presentation space that we're using here. Um, but I want to walk through this very quickly because this actually gives us a concept of what is a learning map. And a learning map is this progression of learning objectives and assessments or the ways to measure. Okay, most of this should be standards based, but it could actually be any mechanism that is defined by an LEA or a local educational authority. So it's their choice. Okay, but the idea of a learning map is, is that it doesn't necessarily have to be linear. It can have branches or junctions. So there may be more than one way to get to a given uh, point. Okay, so uh, what's important about this is this provides us a mechanism for uh, trying to take items that are, are learning modules or components of learning in one way or another and to couple those with means for measuring or taking assessments as to how someone is doing with those. And that provides this mechanism of linkage across those. Now what's important about the linkage is that this suddenly gives you the ability to say that we could have different perspectives over how this learning map might be used. So in a given school district, uh, there's the teacher's perspective, there's the student's perspective, parent's perspective, um, or others that are actually involved in defining what curriculum objectives are and so forth to measure uh, an individual's progression or entire cohorts of uh, students. Okay. There are many ways that that can be visually represented. Okay, and for instance, this hexagon one shows us that, that any adjoining um, uh, hexes can actually uh, uh, get you from one point to another. So in this case, you start in the lower left-hand corner and work your way to the upper right-hand corner uh, for math objectives here. Or they could be other kinds of visualizations. But the important thing is, is that we're taking content, objectives, measures, and coupling that with learning data. Okay, so that's that's the basic idea. Okay, now how do we do such a thing? And that is basically uh, defined in this area here with the uh, three red clouds basically saying that there are three service objectives that must be uh, uh, obtained in order to provide such services. Okay, that would be identity management data services to, to normalize or standardize that data in some way, and uh, the multi-tenancy portal environment, which is what we're here to talk about today. So I'm going to hit each one of these just real quickly, uh, and because we've lost some time, but the idea of the data is, is that there's a notion of many source systems in a given school district. So you've got student information systems, transportation systems, uh, attendance grade books. There are many, many ways that they actually do the business of the school district. Getting that into some sort of a standard or normalized model, uh, like Ed5 or some other data model that uh, gives us some definition of how to store that data, that provides us the ability to normalize data across school districts so they all come in in some sort of a standardized fashion and that provides us the ability to actually propagate that data uh, to other data sources, other data models, or for reporting purposes or other things using standardized definition. Okay, this demonstrates how that might actually work and in the educational environment for K-12 we have uh, several different uh, data standards that are in use. Uh, the SIP or, or the school interchange um, uh, framework is a fairly standardized operating environment or data model uh, definition. Uh, it uses what they call a zone integration server or is this and that this provides endpoints that can be um, uh, set up as either a listener or as a propagator of data. So they're basically web services that can be used in that environment. We use that standardized data model 
to build service provider endpoints or endpoints that service providers can use um, from either the SIP data model or the EDFI data model. And we were looking at Enbloom, but they're no longer there, but I have an updated the slide. So this continues to uh, be the basic objective so that you've got a mechanism that allows you to assemble data, to compose data, and then to be able to propagate data for meaningful use purposes. Okay. The next portion is the identity portion. Obviously, if we're going to use this kind of an environment, we have to have some sort of a standardized mechanism that allows us to uh, have people log in in a unified way. We're also interested in being able to do that uh, so that we can support um, uh, web single sign-on uh, type of an environment for our user base so many applications can actually participate. We're using the Shibboleth environment to do this with and we've created what's called an IEP proxy. So we have one centralized service that actually delegates authentication requests to the number of school districts that are participating. Okay, so that's good. Say again? Uh, time is good. I, you've been so quick that I think we're on track. Okay. Yeah. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is a much uh, bigger and, and uh, more explanatory um, uh, picture of how a single sign-on environment would actually work utilizing uh, Shibboleth. And um, uh, on the left-hand side of this chart here, we see the IDP. And the IDP is actually, like I said, delegating uh, authentication requests to authoritative directory systems at a given school district. So we've negotiated how we do that and standardize the operating requirements for that so that we can design and implement an interface within the U portal environment that makes this a self-service procurement environment. So if a new school districts come on board, they can effectively work through this. And as we talk through the portal implementation, it will start to make some sense as to how that's actually uh, implemented. Okay, there are lots of different kinds of service providers that can participate. Anything from the World Wide Web, uh, the Wild West, as we might refer to, you know, things that you can find on the internet. Uh, there may be applications that are resident within the environment of the school district themselves, in other words, legacy or proprietary applications that they own or have created. Um, and of course, there could even be legacy systems that are being used inside their environment. And the idea is, is trying to implement that in such a fashion that you have a one-time sign-in and we share the session across all of those applications. So single sign-in. Okay. Application services, or now we're getting to the portal part. So the application services are designated here. And what's important about our portal environment is, is that we have the notion of an unknown user or an unauthenticated user authenticated users, and then users that actually directly belong to a school district themselves. So an unauthenticated user is obviously a, a, someone who has not logged into the system or cannot log into the system, so they would find only informational resources that are available to the public. A known user is a special case. That might be someone who is not employed by a school district, but actually volunteers their time, serves as a mentor, or has some role or capacity in participation in the educational process for the students that uh, may be there. Perhaps they're, they're peer group mentors uh, for other teachers or individuals that are involved. But those that are actually logging into the environment and participating in the use of data and utilizing the identity system, we expect those folks to be legitimately employed by or uh, a student of uh, a given school district that we are serving in our environment. Um, our portal environment is um, um, represented here to show that there is some capacity for each of those uh, three types of users uh, to be able to come in. This first uh, image here on the left kind of shows an unauthenticated user seeing informational resources. They have a login button that they can click. It is branded uh, for the tenancy owner, which in our case happens to be a long time cloud. And then if somebody clicks that login button, and um, they would be giving us three parameters at that point. That's their username, their password, and which organization that they actually belong to, which school district. School districts are listed in a drop-down list for them so that they can choose that. And then in a, at the completion of the act of logging in, they would have a branded uh, presentation that they're seeing that is for their own school district. And uh, in each of these um, uh, 
district environments, the application spaces are defined by the uh, administrators for that district. So each district would have a unique collection of applications. There's also the concept of global applications being available to all districts that are participating in the environment. In our project space, we have two applications that kind of fit that uh, goal. One of those is for the career workforce development side of things. It's called IOER, or the Illinois Open Educational Resources, and it essentially is a, a mechanism that helps to find content uh, for various topics that uh, may be of interest. Uh, those are specifically for uh, workforce development. Okay, this one kind of shows how that logging process is supposed to work and how we're computing uh, variables that are propagated as part of the uh, web single sign-on uh, so that applications are able to derive some features as, as to what the identity of an individual might be, what their role is in the school system. These are just the default things that we're doing. And then each application may have their own custom uh, attributes that they need to know about, which is represented in the lower right hand. This uh, slide kind of demonstrates for us how each school district might be different. There are three uh, roughed out um, um, representations there for three different school districts and the owner site itself. Uh, some representation of differences in, in content that might be available on the portal site itself. So one new portal implementation, but many, many views of that depending on what the user's orientation to the system is, okay, which organization that they belong to. Okay, and now we're going to Drew's part, yeah. and he gets to do his part. I think I made up your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. All right, uh, I'm going to experience the same problem that Bernie did in that I need to see what I'm talking about. So I'm going to stand just here. Uh, so how many, uh, oh, uh, and, and thank you everyone for your patience and bearing with us and getting this set up. That was a, a remarkable odyssey, honestly, getting this one done. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, how many were at the uh, State of the Port uh, address yesterday? Uh, the majority, and, and that's what I expected. Uh, thank you. Uh, at the state of the portal, we listed one of the things we quickly talked about at a high level uh, was this uh, notion of multi tenancy and the tenant manager and so forth. I showed a couple screenshots. I think I've got those screenshots in here. Uh, but what we didn't do, is, and what we're going to do here, is dive into that in detail and like spill all the little secrets of how that works. Uh, it, it, and how it's been uh, implemented in ePortal, how multi-tenancy has been implemented in ePortal. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I warn you up front that uh, the next portion of this talk is uh, it, it is more or less technical. Uh, there are, uh, you know, Java class names and configuration files and so forth that appear in the slides uh, from here on out. At any rate, so, but to recap, again, to set the, set the stage, set some context. Uh, the multi-tenancy, the notion of multi-tenancy is a portal within a portal that you can offer to a school district uh, in the case of this portal or uh, in, in the case of a university portal perhaps it's a um, uh, the medical school or the law school or maybe a, you know just a department in another campus, who knows. Uh, we can offer a unit within the organization, within the community, uh, their own sort of privately branded uh, you know, sandbox portal uh, within a portal uh, over which uh, representative uh, individuals, uh, tenant administrators, have authority to, to curate and manage some of the content uh, as well as the brand, you know, the skin and the logo. Uh, so this again, you know, as I showed yesterday, uh, these are screen captures for the tenant manager portlet. On the left we've added a link uh, to the portal administration portlet to access the tenant manager. Uh, and then on the right, we've got sort of the list, you know, you know, the first view, the list view of the tenant manager, followed by, uh, you know, the, the form you get, uh, the HTML form that appears when you click add a tenant. Uh, I should say this is one incarnation of the form. Uh, and you'll see uh, why uh, shortly, because actually, the form fields that appear on there are, are, are very flexible and open-ended. You can really capture any metadata about a, um, about a tenant that you, that you want to. 
So as promised, here is some XML con configuration, right? We, we, we've got to have our quota of that at the uh, JC conference. All right, this is the area of conference. Uh, this is the <laughs> services context that, uh, XML, uh, you know, file. It's one of the standard context files uh, in the portal. Uh, and, and this sort of is this is new, uh, all brand new with the concept of multi-tenancy appears at the bottom of the file and there are two beams. There are two beams defined here. The top one is uh, it's, it, it's a map called tenant manager attributes and the bottom one is a list called tenant operations listeners and I'm going to go into detail on each of these. Uh, so the tenant manager attributes beam its role, it defines uh, the tenant metadata that you want to capture, as I said, beyond, beyond the name. So looking back at this form in the lower right, uh, that name form field is, you know, is sort of hard-coded. It is uh, unavoidable. It's required. Uh, but everything else on this form is, is either option or optional or could be something else entirely. Uh, and this is where uh, that is managed in the tenant manager uh, attributes beam. It defines uh, the metadata that you want to use beyond name. Uh, the keys are become the form fields. They get translated into form fields. And the values you know, in that beam, that's the uh, top beam there, uh, the values are used to look up um, you know, a, a uh, internationalized uh, string for the label of the form field uh, in the um, uh, message source. All right. Uh, so great. We uh, we define these things that appear in the in the HTML form in the tenant manager. Uh, a, a properly uh, authorized user, uh, you know, creates a tenant, enters values into these things. They get uh, stored as in the attributes collection on um, uh, on. The, the tenant object, which is managed by uh, JPA and Hibernate, just like other persistence in the portal more broadly. Uh, these form fields, these uh, this metadata that you enter in the tenant manager, manager is furthermore available to, uh, of course it is, uh, available to I tenant operations listener instances, which leads us to the other beam, right? In this uh, configuration file, we've got two beans here. I've talked about the first. The second one is a list of iTenant operations listener objects. And these things, uh, their role, they have methods like onCreate, onUpdate, and onDelete. They react to uh, you know, major life cycle events uh, with tenants. So uh, when I create a tenant, all of the listeners in the list almost a tongue twister. Uh, all of the listeners in the list have an opportunity uh, to, uh, to inspect that information and do what they need to do. Uh, and there are three concrete implementations of I tenant operations listener uh, in the portal code base. And with the Illini Cloud uh, portal, we have, we have a fourth. We have a custom one. It's called the uh, Trident uh, iTenant Operations Listener. It, its role is to reach out to the uh, identity system that is another part of this big solution uh, and notify the identity system that uh, a tenant has been created because there, there are many steps in, in you know, management of the, of the tenant that need to take place in that system as well. Uh, but the three that are here um, that are included in the ePortal code code base, the three that are listed in the screen capture of the configuration file that I showed are the template data tenant operations listener, uh, the reset password uh, tenant operations listener, and the JPA persistent tenant operations listener. Uh, let me catch my breath here after that. Uh, all right, so I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about the template data tenant operations listener. Uh, here. So, so I'll save that for later. Here I'll mention the role of the other two uh, besides custom. Uh, the, the, actually, the persistence, I, I told you, of tenants is managed by um, Hibernate and JPA, you know, just like the rest of the portal. That's great, but the, the actual 
lines of code that uh, you know call store on the Hibernate session, or, or actually send the information uh, to Hibernate and, and via Hibernate to the database. Those lines of code are actually in the JPA persistent uh, persistence tenant operations lister. And the reason for that, it makes seem a little strange. It certainly did to Andrew uh, Petro, who's not here, so I guess I can pick on him. Uh, and uh, in fact, it wasn't implemented that way originally. But in in addressing all the uh, the use cases with uh, Illini Cloud and kind of thinking it through, we realized that uh, we may want some operations listeners to add to add to or adjust the metadata in tenants as they're created before they're saved, or before uh, maybe they're updated. So we wanted. But many things happen when a tenant is created, and, and believe me, it's many. We're going to get into that. Many things happen when a tenant is created, and it's and it's completely open ended. We've got uh, you know a custom operations listener that talks to the Trident system, like I, I told you about. Uh, it it may be important what order they happen in. Uh, we may need uh, the ability to specify what order all these things happen in, and that's the role. Of the list of these operations listeners, they they happen in the order defined in the list. And one of the things that I want to control when it happens is when the new tenant object gets persisted to the database. So I I implemented the um, the actual call to persist the object in in a listener so that I could control the order in which it happens. All right. So tenant operations listener. Oh, the reset password uh, that. Uh, piggybacks upon that uh, leverages the existing reset my password features in U Portal that I bet you never knew were there. Right? Uh, these so U Portal supports. Uh, it's not commonly used, not often used, but U Portal supports local authentication uh, or database authentication. Uh, you know where there's a uh, credential, the user credential, in a um, table in the portal database. Uh, we don't use it in campus portals typically, but it's there. It's a feature. Uh, well, a few years ago, in connection with the U Mobile uh, effort, Jen Worry built out the ability to uh, built out a portlet for uh, oh, I forgot my password or reset my password uh, for local authentication. So that portlet exists. The uh, code behind that portlet exists. The feature in U Portal to re you know for an individual user to reset uh, his own. Uh, or set for the first time uh, a password with local authentication that was already there. This listener that just interacts with that subsystem, uh, and it, it happens to send an email with a security token to uh, it, you know a user, the user that is created with the tenant. Uh, I'll show you the form fields again. Uh, in this example, we have a. Um, in the tenant manager form, the creation form, we have a contact username. So I'm defining a username. You know, could be A Wills, could be anything, could be longer. Uh, who will be the admin contact for the tenant? And I'm putting in the email. Those two things are used to create, uh, are used within the reset password tenant operations listener uh, to create a local uh, authentication account. Uh, to create a security token that that user can use to set, you know, his or her own password and to generate an email uh, inviting that person to do so. All right. Uh, you none of these are required. If you don't set them up in your configuration, they won't, uh, you know, appear in the. You know, not only will they not happen, but the the inputs for those won't be in the form. All right. Uh, seed data, tenant seed data. Okay, so um, let's see. We know that. Sorry to flip all over here. Uh, we know that tenants need uh, their own brand. Uh, you know, look, which is typically logo and skin. It, we've, I mean, it could be bigger things, but we've kind of made it simple. We have, you know, 800 plus tenants to manage, so we need this to be uh, dead simple. Uh, so pretty much logo and skin, and then uh, they need their own content. They need uh, some of their own portlets and layouts and so forth. And then potentially they need other data like groups and permissions. Well, um, all four of these things in, in U Portal in Responder are data. 
uh, responder uh, implements the skin uh, as a portal. Responder implements the logo as a portal. So uh, the intent here, the desire, the the, uh, the solution for uh, you know multi-tenancy and, and branding and so forth is that we will uh, we will templatize and import a number of uh, portal entities, including a new logo portlet, including a new uh, skin portlet including a uh, portlet category to contain these portlets, including a uh, PAGS group, I think I've got a slide for that coming up, including a brand new database managed PAGS group that puts users into the tenancy, including uh, a, um, a new uh, user account for local authentication, uh, who is the tenant administrator, or the first tenant ad administrator at least, uh, and we need to, uh, you know, when a tenant, a new tenant is created, we need to add all these things to, to the database. But more than that, we need to take information that came from the, the tenant ad form and inject it into these, uh, you know, XML entity uh, things before they get imported. So, uh, you know, that's our solution. The, the template data tenant operations listener is the last of those listeners I listed can import a curated set of template data whenever a new tenant is created. It uses all the standard, all the same import-export features that ePortal has had for years. It's no different from uh, init portal, init DB, or data import, any of the AMP tasks you might use, or from the import-export portlet, for that matter. But it is different in this respect. Uh, it supports uh, Spring expression language. So you can actually, it, the template data, which lives in source main resources, uh, you know, or JSON portal tenants data, it lives in the class path. Uh, that template data, or sorry, yeah, that data, those XML entities, are capable of having uh, spring expressions uh, inside them that get evaluated just before these things get imported. So you can see right here, this is the, uh, I, I believe, the user account. Uh, yes, this is the admin admin contact user, and you can see that the uh, tenant object is being interrogated for uh, the, the username of that admin contact. It's something I put in the form. It's being interrogated for the email, uh, and again for the username uh, beneath. It. So uh, we we have a collection of eight or ten uh, different entity files in the class path that are templatized in this way using Spring expression language. And we uh, evaluate those expressions and import this collection of entities whenever we create a new tenant. Uh, and I, I already sort of mentioned this, but the, uh, the database backed tags group uh, strategy becomes important with the multi-tenancy thing. It, um, it, it's very important uh, when we create tenants for users to be able to associate to be associated with tenants, you know, it, it's it, it's a great thing, but not really in the abstract. We need users to be able to see the uh, you know the tenant looking feel and so forth when they log in. Uh, and the database packed tags group uh, strategy helps us with that because we we certainly don't want to reconfigure uh, tags group store config and restart the portal every time we add a tenant. That would not be much fun. Uh, so here's an example of that. It's also uh, an entity file. It's also templatized with information from the tenant, as you will see. Uh, tenant branding, I mentioned uh, already uh, briefly. Uh, in our case, this boils down to a logo and a skin. Two of the entities we import are portlets that implement these things in Responder. You know, there's a logo portlet and there's a skin portlet, uh, and each tenant gets their own. They also get a category of uh, portlets, uh, you know, over which they have authority, management authority. And uh, this is what they look like. Uh, on the left, you can see the logo portlet. Uh, and I managed to capture an image of it with the little gear icon that appears when, when someone 
with, um, with the right authority, with the right privilege, hovers the mouse over the portlet, the gear appears, so a tenant administrator would be able to click on that and enter config mode. It is nothing, uh, nothing less than, nothing more, nothing less than a simple CMS uh, portlet. Uh, and so the tenant administrator has the opportunity to type in the name uh, of their organization, to type in whatever they want, or upload uh, a logo with the simple CMS. Then the portlet on the right is the skin portlet, which has uh, a um, has inputs and a color picker for choosing you know what color you want your your portal to be as a tenant. Uh, tenants can define more portlets than that, however, moreover. Uh, tenants get a um, category of portlets that they have management authority over. They can add to the portlets to this category. It's the only category they can add to, but they can add portlets to the category. Uh, and we give them a mechanism to do so, but we have it uh, limited pretty severely versus what you know those of you who manage portals know. We don't actually want uh, tenants to define like SQL portlets or you know complex Java portlets or, or whatever in the portal. That's uh, way too much control and way too much complexity and, and, and technical knowledge uh, for the audience that we're targeting. So we created a super simple app launcher portlet uh, that where you specify uh, this is how you you know sort of syndicate or bring in a, a, an app or an external website or or system into the portal. You specify a URL and a title, and optionally, you can provide an image, uh, a link title, and a subtitle. Uh, you know, it's dead simple. It takes just a few seconds uh, to set one up, uh, and it, you know, it's easy to understand and, and manage. Uh, this is another contribution from Illini Cloud. This has been added to the JSIG uh, JSIG uh, Widget Portlets project, and it looks basically like this. On the left, you can see the config mode. For the app launcher, uh, where you know that has the six-ish things I can uh, you know choose uh, in in the app launcher or specify, and on the right you can see the app launcher when it's rendering. So on the left I'm defining uh, the Unicon website. It's just www.unicon.net. Uh, I've uploaded uh, an icon which is uh, the Unicon logo. I specify a title and a subtitle, and you can see all that renders on the right. The whole area, the whole portlet area, except for the Chrome at the top, is a, is a hyperlink. If you click on it, you will, you know, go to this app or the Unicon website, uh, either as a, an inline frame or in a new window. And uh, I don't have a screenshot of that. I did yesterday uh, of what you know the iframe looks like. It uses the de uh, detached window state in your portal. Uh, and those of you who would like to see this uh, in action, I, you know, I thought originally maybe I would do that here, but uh, I will invite you to come talk to me uh, in Symphony three and four uh, tonight for the uh, tech demo. And I think that is, I think that's all of it. Now, oh, what? Uh, yeah, not bad. All right, questions, please. One, yes. So in the drop down, you have inline frame, so the other option is new window? A new window, yeah. Does the inline frame come with all of the standard inline frame issues? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, I don't have the um, screenshot here, but it's in detached window state. It, it, it's essentially a portlet. It's the app launcher portlet. It's, it, when the app launcher is in regular window state, these are good questions. Thank you for asking. Uh, when the app launcher is in regular window state, it looks like uh, the image on the right. When the app launcher is rendered in detached window state, it renders as an iframe. Well, assuming you chose iframe and not new window, it renders as uh, an iframe uh, that you know takes over you know 98% of the screen real estate. So it has the entire screen width. Uh, and it has all of the vertical space as well, except a thin sort of 55 pixel um, thick uh, banner at the top that gives you kind of like a home icon and, and you know says your name. So it's almost like maximized mode only. Yeah, it's like mega maximized mode. 
basically. Exactly right. Yeah? Do you have plans to score any uh, additional project types in the future? For uh, with the Line and Cloud tenants? I, I wouldn't say concrete plans. Do you want to answer yeah. that? I, I think what's What's probably important to mention there is this notion of tenancy within the portal as a reflection of tenancy also in our data services and also within the uh, identity services as well. So the notion of tenancy is across the entire application space that we're looking at. And there will be additional uh, portal types that might involve self-service uh, procurement of uh, various services or different types of applications that might be shown in that environment. What our hope was is to, to be able to establish at least a starting point uh, for school districts to define the 30 or 40 applications that they use on a regular basis each day so that they at least have a one-stop shop to go to to launch those particular applications. Nothing precludes us from being able to use the other features of the portal environment or um, other portal implementations as well. Yes, sir. And can each tenant admin draw upon um, the content of other tenant admins? Okay, they don't actually see each other's spaces. They don't. So there's no cross. Right. There, there was one exception that I mentioned as we kind of looked at some of the um, uh, basic drawings that showed that there's the concept of a uh, at the owner level. So when I enter into the site as a, a Line I Cloud administrator, for instance, the owner of the site itself, not a subtenant, not a school district. Um, if I use the app launcher, that's global. So it's for everyone. Uh, that is a tenant in that environment, and they would see those applications in a tab that's available to them. Each tenant has their own tab uh, that is available to them for their district site level, uh, and they can also create more tabs that will be related to various job roles. So for instance, if I've got a teacher that's teaching uh, preschool, they would have a collection of applications that they're using that is not applicable to somebody who's teaching middle school or high school, for instance. And that allows that district administrator to be able to pick and choose the applications and associate them with the job role. And that job role can also be represented so that when somebody logs in, they're seeing the stuff that they should be able to see and use. And, and I'd like to add uh, that uh, all of that is controlled by standard view portal permissions. Yeah. No magic voodoo there. Yeah, it's 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 a matter of what you import when the tenant is created. If you know, if you have tenant admins who are all like really good friends and trust each other, you could set up the permissions such that they could all you know use and adjust each other's uh, content. Right. So the idea here was is that this notion of tenancy, for instance, the procurement of um, a a tenant uh, portal site is directly associated with a tenant's. Um, um, existence within the identity system. So the idea was is that we need to be able to create a user in the portal site, uh, have some mechanism so that they can log in based upon an email invitation, and define where is their directory system and to provide us the other data that is needed to integrate uh, that local directory service uh, where we're going to delegate authentication. Okay, that delegation process is, is being handled by our hybrid IDP proxy. Uh, the try to product basically, and uh, that will provide us information about what uh, a user's role might be within their environment, whether it's a teacher or a student or another administrator of some type. So those privileges are activated in that fashion. So the intent was never to use local uh, authentication or local users beyond that first one. And his job is to basically fill out a form or to engage with a workflow process that allows us to do attribution for who's doing what and notifications and to be able to get approvals uh, all the way up the hierarchy of the school district to the superintendent. Because ultimately, there's only one custodian, it's the superintendent. Any more? Okay, well thank you very much. Thank you.